Uh, hello, uh, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar organized by the George L. Mossy Program in History and the Center for European Studies here at UW Madison. Uh, I'm Michael Paul Martosio. I'm an assistant professor here at UW, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome Pamela uh, H. Smith this afternoon. Professor Smith is the Seth Lowe Professor of History at Columbia University and founding director of the Center for Science and Society. She has authored numerous books on the history of alchemy, artisans, and the making of vernacular and scientific knowledge in early modern Europe, including The Business of Alchemy, Science and Culture in the Holy Roman Empire in 1994, and The Body of the Artisan Art and Experience in the Scientific Revolution in 2004, both of which won uh, numerous awards. Uh, today, she's going to be talking about her new book, From Lived Experience to the Written Word, Reconstructing Practical Knowledge in the Early Modern World, which was awarded the 2023 George L. Mossy Prize from the American Historical Association. In From Lived Experience to the Written Word, Professor Smith considers how and why, beginning around 1400, European craftspeople began to write down their making practices. Uh, it's a great book if you get a chance to read it. Uh, as I was saying to uh, Professor Smith before uh, before you all joined, uh, if you get a chance to read it, you're never going to look at butter quite the same way. There's a great chapter that, that looks at the ways in which butter is being used in, in kind of the metalworking industry. Um, just to say, uh, Professor Smith will speak for about 45 minutes. I'll then introduce our commentator, Alice M. Goff, and then I'll open the floor to questions, which if you could um, enter them into the chat function, and then I'll read them off uh, to Professor Smith. Uh, with that, I will uh, hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Michael. And um, thank you to the Mosse Foundation and to Sky Doni uh, for inviting me to give this lecture and to Professor Goff for um, agreeing to um, be a commentator. I also want to thank the American Historical Association for recognizing this book with the George L. Mosse Prize. Um, so I thought the best way to introduce my book would be to briefly parse the book's title from lived experience to the written word, reconstructing practical knowledge in the early modern world. And this book really began in a kind of dissatisfaction that I felt with my previous book, The Body of the Artisan, Art and Experience in the Scientific Revolution, uh, because that book, although I think that it showed that early modern European artisans made novel claims to the knowledge of nature in their artworks and in their written texts, um, and it showed that practice was valued and argued for by its practitioners, I felt that I hadn't really gotten at the bodily and material knowledge of early modern craftspeople. I didn't understand their knowledge of the behavior of natural materials and their actual techniques by which they produced objects, that is, their knowledge. So how could I, in fact, um, obtain that knowledge was my question that I started looking at in about 2000, um, uh, 2003. Um, so first I turned to trying to understand techniques by reading collections of recipes, instructions, so-called how-to books, like the one on the screen here, um, all about works that are done by fire by Venocio Beringuccio, who was a um, uh, metal worker, mine manager. They all had, all these texts had relationship to various artisanal practices. Um, and I'll just say for context sake that from about 1400, many types of craftspeople began to um, write down their techniques. There were many diverse authors and practitioners on mining, on distilling, on horse doctoring, dance masters, many others. But as I read these books of practice, you know, full of recipes, instructions, claims of all kinds, I quickly felt totally at sea. Like, what should I pay attention to? How did I know what was important? What was knowledge in these texts and all these words? Besides which words, especially fixed and written ones, are not very effective at conveying embodied knowledge and techniques. So, you know, just think you can't learn to ride a bike by reading about it. You just have to do it. 
And um, this is a fact that even those artisans who were writing down their techniques commented upon, such as here, Benvenuto Cellini, the um, gold, the Italian goldsmith who wrote um, the two treatises on goldsmithing and sculpture, and also an autobiography that wasn't published until the 19th century. How careful you have to be with this cannot be told in words alone. You'll have to learn that by experience, he says. This was not an uncommon sentiment. Here, Leonardo da Vinci is also making a point that the more minutely you, minutely you describe it, the more you will confound the mind of the reader. And he's what he's really articulating here is a very particular feature of experiential knowledge, embodied knowledge. It's difficult to write down because what do you write down? Descriptions are extremely complicated. They're very context dependent, that is, a craftsperson is using different kinds of materials, responding to changing conditions of the materials and the workshop environments, you know, second by second. And um, what do you write down from that? And how do you write it down? Now, interestingly enough, the problems of writing down technique are also a feature of laboratory procedures in the natural sciences. And this has led to the creation of this online journal of visualized experiments, Jove, in order to train and replicate laboratory work more effectively. <clears throat> so what was this knowledge that was ineffable that another um, Limner here, a portrait painter, a miniature portrait painter, Nicholas Hilliard is also referring to. Um, what is this knowledge that couldn't be put into words? And an even more burning question in my book was, why would they write it down if it couldn't be put into words? So answering those questions gave the title From Lived Experience to the Written word, word, Reconstructing Practical Knowledge, as I came to call this experiential knowledge. I also articulate it by what in history of science is called an actor category, which is Kunst, which of course means art in, um, in German. Um, because that was my my German artisans, at least, um, called this kind of knowledge just as an umbrella term, Kunst, which was art, work of the human hand, the ability to do. Um, so my story was about a particular type of knowledge in my book, but I also realized it was about words and texts as much as it was about materials and objects. So why did artisans begin writing down their knowledge around 1400? Well, the answer to this question, which takes up a few um, chapters of my book, um, part of it is that um, they, they were had become quite self-conscious. They were important, sometimes even members of city councils in, um, in the growing cities um, from the 1400s on like this sculptor who in the 1490s included this life-sized or really over life-sized realistic statue of himself at the base of this incredible 120 foot sacrament house um, that he created in, in a Nuremberg church. So self-consciousness. Another part of the answer was greater literacy on the part of the artisans. And um, for example, here, Jost Amen and Hans Sachs's um, what's been called the Book of Trades in English or the um, Book of Estates, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and these, these writers celebrated and valorized practical knowledge and its practitioners in texts that portrayed craftspeople as diligent, industrious, and importantly, as a central pillar of the social order. Finally, part of the answer was printers. Now, some of these how-to texts were actually compiled or commissioned by entrepreneurial printers, um, which was a group that was kind of between scholars, that is people trained at in schools and universities and artisans, people um, trained primarily in workshops by apprenticeship. Um, these printers experimented with their craft and emphasized the new, and they kept calling them new novel, inventive capabilities of their craft, such as here, um, Johann Schoensberger, the younger, who um, one has this wonderful title page from a new model book for embroidery and, um, and weaving. 
Uh, so he was both making his money from um, model books, from books of practical knowledge, um, and he was also making claims about this kind of knowledge in calling it novel, like a new model book, a neu model book. Um, and indeed, these how-to books often turned out to be bestsellers for the printers with many, many editions. And here is one um, text first published in um, Italian, quickly translated within the next 70 years into many different languages, including Latin, um, and with about 90 editions. So hugely, um, hugely um, disseminated, widespread, and um, much of the knowledge in it was touted as new and improved. Um, so that was some of the reasons why these books started to be written down, but who bought and read these books? Who was the audience for these books? Um, and what I show in the book is that these texts were part of a larger culture of interest in practical knowledge and the making of things, as well as part of a worldwide circulation of objects, which is the early modern world part of the title. Um, and the evidence for this larger culture of interest can be seen, for example, in this painting from um, 1616, the Allegory of Fire. And you can see that these techniques of um, the wonderful water-driven trip hammer by which they are um, hammering out steel armor, uh, the polishing wheels in the background, the putting um, steel rims onto cannon carriages, the forge with hammering out the metal um, on the left side of this, um, of this detail of the image. And then, of course, all of the objects that are produced by these techniques. So this is really shows an interest in these kinds of um, techniques, this kind of practical knowledge, and of course, the objects by which they're made. Now, collecting natural and human-made objects was a kind of key activity for these aficionados of art, by which I mean the work of the human hand. Um, and the objects that were made according to the processes of the manuscript, which I per, um, really forms a very important part of, the, um, of my book, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, might have been collected together in the 16th century in what was called often a Kunstkammer, a chamber of art, as is portrayed here in this image. Um, and this was a collection of natural and artificial or human-made things. So paintings and sculpture, but also shells and uh, butterflies and insects and other kinds of things um, actually collected from nature. Now, these collections aim to spark conversations on the relationship of the artifice of nature to the artifice of the human hand. And they really provide more evidence of this new interest in the relationship between natural processes and human art, as well as an interest in the power of this practical knowledge to produce. Um, so, so that really you know, is the portion of the book that talks about books and their readers. Um, but what of that ineffable knowledge held by craftspeople that had confused me so much in reading their works? And I realized that I must, as the 16th century intellectual reformer known as Paracelsus urged, hasten to experience. And I just love this quote. Um, for who could be taught the knowledge of experience from paper, since paper has the property to produce lazy and sleepy people who are haughty and learn to persuade themselves and to fly without wings. Therefore, the most fundamental thing is to hasten to experience. He was a kind of key figure in my previous book, The Body of the Artisan. Um, so how did I hasten to experience? Well, first of all, I followed conservators around at the Getty, um, art conservators at the Getty and at the Victorian Albert Museums um, for a couple of years. And then I took their advice to take hands-on courses on historical techniques. And I then worked with a silversmith and conservator, Tony Benches at the Rijksmuseum to reconstruct techniques of life casting, which I was very interested in. And that is in fact the reconstructing part of the title, reconstruction of practical knowledge in the early modern world. 
One text in particular, this remarkable um, text in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, MSFR 640, um, which contains very detailed accounts of life casting of all kinds of animals and plants. And this is an anonymous late 16th century French manuscript um, that contains all kinds of notes, not just on life casting, all kinds of notes, instructions, observations on many, many different trades, on processes, on techniques of many kinds. It's not a recipe book. It's very repetitive, confusing, rather chaotic, and there is much left out in many of these processes. So all work on my own book ceased at this point when I founded the Making and Knowing Project in 2014, um, you know, 10 years ago to investigate and reconstruct the practices in MSFR 640. And then after about seven years, um, in 2020, we published a digital critical edition of this text. And if you have read or read from lived experience to the written word, you'll see that the last two chapters are very much informed by the research that came out of this quite immense undertaking of creating this digital edition. Um, I very much hope you'll copy down this, um, this URL and you'll want to explore it because it not only contains a full French transcription, well, actually a diplomatic transcription and a um, lightly uh, normalized transcription, um, but also an English translation, as well as about 130 essays that treat the techniques, reconstructions, and culture um, and which in many ways deal with the themes, deal much more detail um, with the themes of my book. Um, so that's that's the book, From Lived Experience to the Written Word, Reconstructing Practical Knowledge in the Early Modern World. So now what I'd like to do for the rest of the talk is to say a bit more about this remarkable MSFR 640 and its processes. So how this manuscript came into being remains a mystery, but it's clear that it was composed in Toulouse after 1580 and belonged in 1662 to Philippe de Bethune, an old noble at the courts of two kings of France, who was an art collector, such as works of Caravaggio. Um, this was rediscovered in a French church um, about 20 years ago, and you can see Maybe you can see this. The um, the coat of arms is the same on the um, painting as on the book on the cover of this manuscript. All of uh, the Betunes would have covered all of their works in um, in this binding before they donated it to the um, library of the king in sixteen. 62. So perhaps Philippe de Bethune commissioned the manuscript from a metal worker. Perhaps he bought it from an ambitious artist. We don't know. But Philippe de Bethune was interested in art, that is the work of the hand. Um, and he wrote as a statesman, he wrote in 1663, the counselor of state. And he stated that founding manufactories would bring significant prosperity to a country um, and like others at this time, he sees the arts and trades as part of the necessary knowledge of a prince in order to develop prudence, that is practical knowledge. And he makes clear that he's, you know, the prince's trade is not to become an actual tradesman, not to be, um, uh, uh, is not to become an engineer or to erect a bridge or to become a good canon founder, but to recognize those who are best suited and make sensible use of people from all sorts of professions. Now, MSFR 640 names professions about 200 times, including painters, artists, glaziers, pewters, potters, cloth fullers, goldsmiths, many, many, many others. Um, uh, over 100 mentions of distinct trades or professions. And you can look at this um, yourself in the edition. Um, you can actually go to the list of entries, which includes all 927 entries in the manuscript, in the 100 in the 340 pages of this manuscript. Um, and you can filter them by, um, by a number of categories that were created by the Making and Knowing Project. And here you can filter by profession. Um, and that's what I'm showing you, just a just sort of a one of the ways in which you can use the edition. <clears throat> 
Well, I was first interested in the life casting entries in FR640. It contains many, many other types of art objects and daily life objects, and it gives much evidence of firsthand experience and experimenting. It's really a unique source for studying artisanal knowledge. Here's an overview of the contents made by the Making and Knowing Project that illustrates the diversity of processes in the manuscripts over 900 entries. Um, you can see that a third of it is casting, about 14% um, has to do with painting, um, metal processes, varnish, arms and armor, there's a fair amount, 5% of um, on arms and armor. And these are, again, I, I hasten to add, um, the, the Making and Knowing Projects categories, a way to kind of index the, the manuscript. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about how we researched this manuscript and what we found. So I'm going to move now to the content of the manuscript um, to let you know some of the insights that are um, in that digital critical edition, but also in um, my book, From Lived Experience to the Written Word. <clears throat> So we created the edition, the Making and Knowing Project created the edition starting in 2014 through a series of courses. <clears throat> I'm gonna go over these very briefly um, before returning, uh, before turning to our research results. So there were four stages. There were um, the paleography, the text workshops in which we had <clears throat> graduate students who were already advanced French um, speakers, readers to um, transcribe and translate the manuscript as they learn skills of Middle French paleography, TEI markup, and group translation. They prepared the manuscript for eight semester-long grad laboratory seminars that researched and reconstructed the recipes in the manuscript, and students wrote essays that went on to form the critical apparatus of the edition. And student essays were written in very close dialogue with the Making and Knowing team members, that is um, a number of postdoctoral students, myself, and the expert practitioners who we invited to the lab for about two, one to two weeks every semester. So that sculptors, conservators, um, artists, uh, taxidermists, all kinds of people who had an interest in or knowledge of historical techniques um, we were able to in, bring into the lab. <clears throat> the third component was an annual working group meeting in which scholars came together with the students who had been in the lab class for both semesters. They shared a lot of their own knowledge and they did a kind of peer review of the student work. So that was very important. Um, the, the fourth component was digital development. And in three digital classes from 2017 to 2019, we prototyped the edition and experimented with computational analysis that um, our markup makes possible. And then we had 18 months of extremely intensive editorial cleanup and quality control. Okay, so through all of this extremely immersive and intensive work, we gained many insights into practical knowledge a few of which I've listed here, which I'm going to talk about a couple of these. Um, but you can always go for more information to the hundreds of essays in the edition itself. Um, okay, so what are some of the insights that we got? Well, for example, sensory tools. In our first year in the project, students repeatedly questioned where quantities were in the manuscript. You know, they were trying to reconstruct here a mold material <clears throat> for making molds and for casting metal into. And they kept saying, oh, but there are no measurements. I don't know how much to add, how much on you see them adding to this ground brick and, um, uh, uh, and earth mixture, a, um, a liquid substance of elm roots boiled in red wine. Those are some of the techniques in the manuscript and we are trying to reconstruct them here. So they had a lot of trouble. And finally, they came to look for not quantities, but qualitative consistency descript descriptions. Like here, the consistency of mustard. You can see, then apply a thick coat as thick as mustard or a little bit thicker over the metal. This is talking about how to make a mold of an already existing metal to copy um, 
<clears throat> and uh, so unusually in the manuscript, because there are very few culinary recipes in the manuscript, there is one for mustard. So the students were able to reconstruct the mustard recipe and we were able to think about consistency. Um, so these are, um, this is an example of a sensory tool that is part of embodied experience. So there I am getting at the actual knowledge that craftspeople have. We realized how central these consistency statements were in artisanal knowledge such as this one that the lab named the squeeze test and the way that it's described in the manuscript where it's described several times talking about that the sand that is the molding material should give a nice hold as you can see in the middle um, photo but still come apart easily as you can see in the far right photo. Um, and you know we came to realize that in fact Qualities are far more important than quantities in a world where materials do not arrive in the lab in standardized form, in which the workshop might have been open to the weather. So in fact, consistency descriptions provide more precision than quantitative measures do. So that gives you just one kind of sense of how different this knowledge um, system is. And we would never have really realized this component of um, artisanal knowledge without reconstructing these processes. Here is another sensory tool, visual rather than tactile. It was, it's called the paper test for measuring temperature before thermometers. Um, there are many different techniques listed for measuring temperature um, with uh, hair, putting hair in and seeing how fast it ignites, green leaks to see how fast they get hot, um, with the fingers or the hands in the case of less hot surfaces. And the hands and fingers, as many researchers have shown, are capable of very sensitive discernment between levels of heat. <clears throat> Another component of artisanal knowledge the, um, is constant, unceasing experimentation. About a third of the manuscript deals with metal casting and shows traces of just constant experiment. Try this. Um, and you know this is obviously it, this is also a kind of obvious fact. Any making process, especially with non-standard materials, needs a great deal of trying out, experimentation of trying, reflecting on that trial, extending the the trial, sometimes failing, doing it a different way, changing your process. And you see this very clearly in the many many trials of materials for making molds for casting metals on the part of this author practitioner. Here, the students reconstructed the scores of experiments in the manuscript for mixing sulfur, wax, and pigment to make a better modeling and molding material. And in many of the processes of FR640, raw materials are pushed beyond native properties by adding something else to them. In this case, um, uh, charcoal, in the case of the black um, wax, molded wax here, and in the case of the photos on the right, sulfur, in order to push them beyond their native properties to take on the characteristics and appearances of other substances. So here is what I mean. This is transformation by pushing materials along a continuum of properties. And what we have there is it moves this material from the brittle, shiny nature of sulfur on the left, right, which is takes um, uh, detail very well in a mold, but you can't really see that detail because it's so reflective and shiny. It also breaks easily. It's very brittle. Um, to the uh, pure beeswax on the right, which is neither sharp um, details, nor you can't see anything on it because it's so opaque. Um, and what you have in the middle are different combinations of uh, sulfur and beeswax that combine the desirable qualities of sulfur, sharpness and of detail, and beeswax to create a more tractable or maniable, more handleable um, material that actually, you know, um, accomplishes the goals. <clears throat> Uh, in all these processes of combining and transforming different materials, from their native states, hard, brittle oyster shells, for example, into fine, powdery, impalpable sand. The author practitioner is investigating the properties of materials and how to transform them from one state to another. 
This focus is shared by many early modern practical writing on transforming materials into more workable or useful forms, such as brittle iron into malleable steel. This constant material transformation, in uh, this constant material investigation into transformation, which is common to any workshop in this period, is a way to hypothesize about what materials and processes work and through this to articulate taxonomies of materials and standard ways of processing. These experiments in transformation reveal underlying ingredients and properties of transformation. Uh, excuse me, they, these experiments in transformation reveal underlying ingredients and properties of materials and assist in understanding relationships among them. From such experimentation, standard components emerge. Standard components such as technical terms. An example is impalpable, impalpable, which we realized finally, as we saw it more and more often, it's a technical term used by metal workers in French, Italian, and English. And here the author practitioner actually defines it. He says, I tried the foot bone of an ox quite burned, pulverized, and very well crushed on porphyry, that is on a porphyry slab, until it is fine enough to slip through your fingers without being felt a good definition of impalpable. Out of such intensive firsthand experimenting, systemic knowledge of natural materials emerges, such as here in the system of categories used by the author practitioners and other metal workers. He uses uh, categories of cold, hot, wet, and dry, which we associate with Aristotle, go back very far, but much more prevalent in his writing and in his practice is the opposition of fat, and lean and sour and sweet, um, <clears throat> brittle and soft. Um, sour is associated with brittleness, sweetness with soft or malleableness. Um, and these, these sets of binaries form a um, underlying set of underlying principles that structures practice. So I, I, I have come to call this systematized set of principles or categories a material imaginary. This material imaginary contains these standard technical terms, taxonomies of material properties such as, um, you know, hot, dry, and lean, um, and dry, uh, sorry, lean and fat. Um, and it articulates systemic relationships between these materials and properties. This material imaginary also contains material metaphors. A metaphor is a rhetorical term, as all of you know, to denote the use of language that moves the reader or listener to a higher level of interpretation or understanding. And we realized that there were also material metaphors when we were recreating the author practitioner's many, many experiments with sulfur. This is a versatile, very widespread material. It's absolutely everywhere in the manuscript. He's using it constantly, especially in casting, obviously. It has valuable properties, including its ready availability, a low temperature melting point, and its quick and great plasticity and utility in many kinds of processes. It also combines well with other materials. So with such versatility, sulfur seems to signal, or better put, to enact through its particular material properties, the concept of exploring by trying or essaying, you know, S-A-A, -A, um, to assay or essay, to try. This invitation to enact new processes is a material metaphor because the material's properties lead the experimenter to reach another plane of action, or better put, thought action. That is the combination that really makes up embodied knowledge, that makes up practical knowledge, thought action. In many of these processes, such as color making here, and in art more generally, raw materials are processed or pushed beyond their native properties in order to take on or to imitate the characteristics and appearances of other substances. Um, here, a gold colored pigment that imitates physical gold, it's still used by furniture makers to imitate gilding. Um, the manuscript contains instructions for imitation of all kinds, um, imitation marble, imitation glass, rouge clair, all substances found on extant objects from the 16th century. The manuscript's focus thus is partly about imitating more expensive materials in a cheaper media, such as here, 
emeralds, imitation emeralds. Um, there are many imitation precious stones in the manuscript. It's also about the imitation of optical effects, for example, red wine into white wine in one of the sleight of hand tricks in this manuscript, or imitating the particularity of flesh tones um, that differ by gender and age. Um, there's also a recipe for counterfeit coral, um, counterfeit here meaning not fake or deceptive, but a convincing portrait or imitation. Um, and I just want to say a word about imitating that striving to imitate other substances by transforming materials organizes the goals and processes in the practical work of processing materials. So um, that's a very important, you know, way to organize and structure um, artisanal knowledge. <clears throat> But imitation is also about gaining knowledge of natural processes. The 16th century author practitioner Bernard Palissy, he was a potter and many other things besides, claimed to imitate natural processes of the earth in his making of ceramics, particularly in his imitation of jasper on the right. These are glazed sp spoons to imitate jasper. And through such making, he developed what he called theories about, and actually what he called a philosophy about the formation um, processes of rocks and minerals in the earth. Now, the manuscript also contains a recipe for imitation jasper. And you can see our three-year struggle to try to imitate jasper in the three stages of these, um, these photos here. Um, and they're all compared, well, the first two are compared left to right, are compared to um, polished jasper and then unpolished jasper. Jasper is extremely diverse. Um, and then on the far right, our final attempt, which um, as the author practitioner said, you can use this imitation jasper to um, encrust bed frames with. So we tried to put it into some into a little wood frame to see how it would look. But in any case, my point here is that, um, you know, the author practitioner of MSFR 640 does not make knowledge claims. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, kind of theorize his knowledge explicitly or does not make a knowledge claim explicitly. Um, but he is nevertheless engaged in the same sort of investigation and experimentation that underlies Palissy's same methods of making knowledge about the natural world. So Palissy's claims are thus, and the author practitioner is engaged in the everyday practical knowledge of the workshop, which includes material imaginaries, theories about the you know, formation of minerals in the earth and so on. Another connection between imitating and knowledge making is in the manuscripts imitation of living things through techniques such as life casting, which I've talked about. He was preoccupied with imitating and preserving the lifelikeness of ephemeral living things by this spectacular transformation of materials through life casting. He also preserved lifelikeness through processes of preserving the plant or animal itself. And I noted the interest in this period in the relationship between art and nature in the Kunstkammer. And we can find it in entries in MSFR 640 that aim to preserve flowers and taxiderming, early taxiderming techniques of animals. And in these recipes for preserving animals, he gives an account of the process of taxidermy. And then he adds, one can add a painted tongue or horns or wings or anything you may imagine the same goes for rats or any animal. Thus, he isn't just imitating life and nature in his attempt at lifelikeness, but he's also, you can see here, playing on how the human hand can alter and transform nature. And this is an explicit aim of the Kunstkammer, and such collections often included these kind of hybrid animals that the process for which is included in MSFR 640. Finally, I want to turn, um, I think, probably to conclude to vernacular natural history in the manuscript. So um, this is demonstrated here by arranging a snake on a clay base at the mold in order to cast. Now, what do I mean by vernacular natural history? I mean, all that experiential knowledge that underpinned the work of wise women, such as those on the left who are collecting herbs, root cutters on the right. These are the people 
unnamed, uh, and did, never wrote down what they did, um, who supplied pharmacists and physicians in this period with medicinals. They knew what plants were efficacious, where to gather them, and what times of the year, and what ailments they treated. These intermediaries between the material world and the textual knowledge of university-trained physicians were essential in making knowledge about the natural world and were part of a distributed network of knowledge making about natural things. In MSFR 640, there is much vernacular natural history, including observations about and descriptions of catching, keeping, feeding, killing, then molding and arranging of the animals for life casting. The manuscript contains all kinds of such information about animals. Um, and also about keeping birds. And it's very unusual for such vernacular knowledge to be codified in writing at this time. And I'll just mention that there is a fantastic essay in the digital edition by the former snake keeper at the National Zoo in Washington, DC, about these techniques, which actually the ones mentioned in the manuscript are still in use today. And what I think this indicates is really the, that huge reservoir of techniques that only every once in a while surfaces in the world of texts when they are written down. Okay, I am really going to conclude now by saying one word about reconstruction as a technique for coming to understand fully all dimensions of the knowledge generated from the human engagement with materials such as by artisans in the workshop. Among the recipes in this manuscript are a few for medicines, not very many, but um, they include a burn salve entitled Against Burns. Excellent. This recipe is unusual for two reasons. First, because it is explicitly a medical recipe. There aren't that many, as I said. And second, because it has an explicitly religious content, which includes saying a Christian prayer, the Pater Noster, and stirring with holy water. Using the Pater Noster as a means of time measurement was very common in workshops at this time, simply as a way to measure time. But as you can see in this manuscript, if you can just look at the red highlights there, you first say nine paternosters, and then you say eight paternosters and seven, and consecutively doing it until the single and last paternoster. Um, so it seems like a ritual, not to mention the holy water, which um, is, uh, we can talk about that if people have questions. So um, the students, some of the students um, reconstructed this and um, we intoned the 45 pattern osters and stirred. Um, it begins, this mixture of linseed oil and beeswax begins as this kind of murky yellow liquid. Um, and as you add the water, pour it out, add more, and you stir, it undergoes a spectacular inspiriting into a pure white fluffy material. It increases in volume by about five times. And recreating this recipe made us realize the material dimension to this religious ritual. We saw how the spiritual aspects of this process were materialized in this purified, ennobled, inspirited, and according to the author practitioner, efficacious product. We could never have understood this dimension of this recipe without reconstructing it. And reconstruction is another tool in the toolbox of historians who are, you know, investigating certain kinds of topics, um, but it's it seems like it's really necessary in um, understanding experiential knowledge and how to books. So I'm going to conclude there, and I'll just reiterate that in this talk, I wanted to show you firsthand, so to speak, on the work of the Making and Knowing Project, the elements of practical or artisanal knowledge that I discuss in my book. First, um, this constant experimentation that is the human engagement with natural materials, out of which emerges systematized knowledge, um, including technical terms, categories, and taxonomies of material properties, material metaphors, 
and this whole system of knowledge that really articulates um, relationships between materials provides frameworks for practice. The material imaginary structures, practices, and imitation is central to this practical knowledge. Um, it is a, uh, a way of inquiring knowledge. It is a way to structure the process of acquiring that knowledge. And it's really key to learning as an apprentice to transmitting knowledge from workshop to workshop by means of copies. And in working with materials, it articulates goals of experimentation, it organized processes, as I've said, it investigates the relationship between nature and the human capacity for manipulating nature and gives insight, as Pellissi would say, into nature itself. And of course, it also produces that desirable, those desirable objects that function as proof of this type of knowledge. Now, in the 17th century, imitation also became key to new experimental philosophers or the new scientists that asserted that they could know nature in a new way, such as those in the Royal Society. Um, as they said, to recreate or to imitate was to know. And the first projects of the Royal Society of London and the Academy Royale des Sciences were to interview artisans to seek out their processes of material transformation in writing. I want to finish by acknowledging the core members of the Making and Knowing Project, especially the nine postdoctoral scholars with whom I had the privilege of working and who are my co-authors and co-editors of the edition, as well as our digital lead, Terry Carapano, our, our associate project director, Naomi Rosencrantz, our paleography lead, Mark Smith, and project assistant, Caroline Sermon, and of course, many, many others, including all the students who worked on this edition. Um, so thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. <clears throat> I'll leave this URL up for a few minutes, um, just so you can write it down if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was that was fabulous. You just you can see all the the this, the uh, that it's not just the book. That there's this this project that's been going on for for so long, and, and there's so many different sort of ways in which people can engage with it. It's just fabulous. Um, there's just so much to think about here. Um, I think like in that mode, just to kind of get us started and get us thinking, um, I want to introduce our commentator, uh, Alice M. Goth. Professor Goth is an assistant professor of German history at the University of Chicago, whose first book, The God Behind the Marble: The Fate of Art in the German aesthetic state uh, just came out in January. So uh, congratulations, that's great. Um, Mr. Goff's research examines German cultural and intellectual life in the modern world with a focus on material culture, the history of museums, and the history of aesthetics. Professor Goff, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Michael. And um, thanks so much, Sky, for inviting me um, and to Pamela for writing this truly wonderful book. Um, I went back to my notes from the body of the artisan from many years ago and was kind of delighted to find that at the end, I, I wanted to know more about the kind of text as practice. And so you've written the book to answer the questions that remain from the last one. And that's really exciting. Um, so uh, from Lived Experience to Written Word is a book uh, about the importance of experience to the production of knowledge, um, as you've just heard. And um, so I hope in turn, you'll indulge me in a brief kind of narration of my own experience in writing this comment. Um, the first part of this experience involved, of course, reading the wonderful book and being delighted by it at many levels. Um, there are the material and visual delights in which it abounds, which you've just gotten a taste of. Um, as Professor Smith invites us into the material imaginary of early modern artisans through their narration of their own craft. We hear about the healing powers of buttered toast for early modern metal workers. Uh, we discover how lizards are a central organism for probing the dynamic and regenerative capacities of the earth. Um, we hear about the auditory cues that attend the casting of bells 
And as you've just heard, we hear a really miraculous account of making late 16th century burn cells in 2017. Um, the rich material of the book is, uh, I just wanna say for those of you who don't have a physical copy in front of you yet, um, is accompanied by a lavish color image program that offers readers a glimpse uh, of the world that works of history do not often get to include. So there are paintings, there are engravings, there are museum objects, there are manuscript pages, yes. Um, but there are also images of raw materials like cinnabar and jasper, as you've just seen, and also images of material processes, both from the early modern period and from the Making and Knowing project. Um, from lived experience to written word abounds not only with material delights, but with important arguments about the epistemological, social, and political status of handwork and artisan, artisanry um, between the 15th and the 17th century. Continuing the investments of her earlier work, Professor Smith shows us how the embodied practical knowledge of craftsmanship was a central frontier of philosophical production in early modernity challenging scholars to move beyond the categorical distinctions between theory and practice, mind and body, thinker and maker that continued attempt even fields like the history of science and the history of art that one might expect to have long overcome them. Uh, Smith writes, one of my aims in this book is to highlight the artisan's view that intelligence is not held by the mind alone, but instead emerges from the work of the hand. However, Smith also shows us the deep challenges that adhered in the work of the knowing hand in early modern Europe. Craft knowledge was extraordin an extraordinarily valuable resource through this period, an essential component in the conduct of war, in the representation of political power, in the management of industry, in the reform of education. It was also dependent on the support of noble patronage and Smith portrays a world whose intellectual ferment is also tied to rivalries and struggles for advancement, uh, where philosophy and science held considerable prestige. Smith also reminds us of the double-edged understanding of craft, something that could also be uh, not only productive, but also subversive, mysterious, with possibly dangerous connotations. When we read in this book about a life cast of the deformed fingers of a peasant in the Kunstkammer of the Wittelbotsbach, um, in Bavaria, or look in detail at the vivid reproduction of Jan Bruegel the Elder's allegory of fire, uh, it is not difficult to feel viscerally what Smith describes, that handwork was not only valued in this period, but also sometimes violently exploited. So having read the book, um, I turned to the actual process of writing, and here delight turned to a certain amount of apprehension, because this is a book that is after all, in part about writing, uh, one that attends deeply to the questions of skill and legitimacy that the writing of artisan scholars either betrays or belies. Um, it is furthermore, a book about writing about writing. Um, its form, its style, its scope, its language evince careful consideration of how Smith as writer, scholar, artisan, can and should best represent the work of the writer, scholar, artisan she documents and the kind of reading and rumination that this writing might engender. Um, so while I am here in the awkward position of writing about the book about writing about writing, a level of complexity I'm not sure I can live up to, um, I think nevertheless that one of the powerful dimensions of this work is its provocation to historians to think with the epistemological world of early, early modern Europe in their consideration of how writing relates to the production of knowledge, both in the past and in the present, and how writing may or may not be understood as itself a form of craft. And it's around this provocation that I wanna structure my comment today. Um, the book draws on the rich corpus of writing by artisans about their practices that began to emerge around 1400, courtesy of an increasingly urban population, expanded literacy, and the centralization of state power. This genre of writing is not only descriptive of how various craft processes from nautical and navigation to life casting to goldsmithing 
um, took place in the early modern workshop, writing and in some instances publishing, we might add, is part of the making process itself. The page is an arena of experimentation for the development of ideas and the honing of attention. Um, nevertheless, Smith addresses these works with, a, I think, a crucial skepticism. Early modern craftsmen did not need to write. Indeed, presumably the great majority of them did not. While writing could bring status, authority, and renown, it was hardly a requirement for transmitting craft knowledge in a period dominated by apprenticeship. Um, that some did write represents, in other words, a choice. The task of the historian is to ask why. Uh, and it's a question that in my view exhibits uh, the disciplinary commitments of what is in effect a truly interdisciplinary book. The historian, I think in principle, at least agnostic to the media of our sources is ideally poised, I think, to see the form they take not as a premise of analysis, but as the outcome of a contingent set of decisions to one form over another that might have gone much differently. Uh, this question of why write uh, is particularly important in Smith's book, given the many good reasons why not. Uh, the reduction of the complexities of craft production into the medium of written language had myriad benefits for the early modern artisan, as Smith describes, but it was also to some extent a futile endeavor that these makers recognized, struggled with, and commented on, even if they surrendered to rendering their frustrations in print. Um, in the words of the map maker, map maker, map maker <laughs> Joseph Muxen, that appear in the introduction to the book, the craft of the hand cannot be taught by words, but is only gained by practice and expert and exercise. It's a genre of frustration at the limits of language in the face of material creativity um, paired with eventual submission to its conceits that I'm most familiar with from the history of ekphrastic writing in the 18th century, also a genre kind of torn between a rich and confident history of rhetoric on one hand and the demands of empiricism, not only of the eye, but also crucially of the hand in the 18th century on the other. Um, and it seems to me that there might be something interesting to be gained in thinking about the compromises of right, uh, the compromised writing the maker of the maker of things and the compromised writing of the viewer of them uh, might have to say to each other, particularly in this late early modern period. Um, but the dubious question of why writing is not confined to early modernity in Smith's account. On page 204, we come across a statement that I think is emblematic of the book's dual investments in both the history and the present of writing about research. Um, the statement is, books cannot transmit practical knowledge to any great effect, whether for expert readers or for historians, end quote. Um, it's an unnerving statement to encounter towards the end of a book concerned with books about the transmission of practical knowledge, in large part because it is itself also a book in this genre. Um, the richly embodied practical knowledge that must ne necessarily be reduced in its pages are the, as you've heard, the activities of the making and knowing project, which as Smith explains, have run in tandem with her writing and which have been crucial for developing its arguments. Um, this is a reenactment of the tradition of thinking with the hand that is both object and subject of analysis. Um, well, the book is clearly a statement of faith in the power of scholarly writing, um, it does not shy away from asking why. And it's significant that Smith concludes with a call, um, concludes the book with a call for more attention and resources to be devoted to alternatives to text and text-based learning, and for us to celebrate value and support the trades and training by apprenticeship within, and I take it also beyond the academy. Uh, reflecting on the way in which the book asks and answers questions about the relationship of writing to research helped me to see it in the genre of contemporary historical scholarship that may not seem intuitively related, but I think sheds some interesting light on its commitments and I'll also maybe generate some platform for discussion. Um, and that is a literature that is increasingly centered the embodied processes of the experience of historical research, mostly archival research in historical writing. 
I was reminded in several moments um, of reading um, from lived experience to written word of Arlette Farge's allure of the archive and of her struggle to capture the material particularities of the experience of research and print. Farge writes, reading the archive is one thing, finding a way to hold on to it is quite another. There's a kind of difficulty of the manual dimension of, of research that's lost in writing at stake here. Um, there are also perhaps less obvious, but I think no less fruitful resonances with works like um, Kristen Weld's paper Cadavers, a work of simultaneous ethnographic and historical writing about the National Police Archives of Guatemala, which centers the experience of finding, sorting, and opening the records of the atrocities of the Guatemalan Civil War. Um, these and many other works, interestingly, though not always avowedly, produced um, in the wake of the material turn. I think that's something that hasn't necessarily been, been noticed um, or, or commented on. Um, and I think they all share the injunction of Michel Rolf Trio um, that is also deeply resonant with Smith's work. Trio writes, what history is matters less than how history works. Um, I would be curious to know more about how the understanding of the craft of history in From Lived Experience to the Written Word relates to this broader disciplinary trend of writing about thinking and working with the hand. Um, in what ways, if at all, is the laboratory distinctive kind of space for historical experience in the archive? Um, in what ways does the body of the historian matter in this work? not only in relation to the question of skill, which is at the center of this book, but also in relationship to the questions of gender or race or class um, as work that operates along the archival grain has often emphasized. Um, I also wonder whether from lived experience to written word with its focus on the social and political structures that condition craftsmanship in the early modern period and its focus on the institutional resources required for the making and knowing project might also help us to do something that seems to me has been absent from literature centered on archival experience, which is a rethinking of historical craft in light of questions of academic labor and the kinds of environments and infrastructures that are required to, to support it. Um, the vision of history, of history as a craft at stake in Smith's book also prompts questions about early modernity as a source of inspiration and provocation for modern and contemporary historical thought. Um, this is something that I've been considering recently in the context of a project on Renaissance and Baroque art in post-war Germany, a part of which involves the intriguing propensity for museums in both East and West German states to recreate their 16th century Kunstkammer collections, um, a trend that really gets started in the 1950s and then blows up in a big way in the 60s and 70s. Um, behind the zeal for early modern collecting in this period is something of, I think, a return to the ethic of craftsmanship and the definition of art that is at the heart of Smith's work, a more holistic, collaborative, and kind of lowercase materialist view of how ordinary people with skill and creativity could have a role to play in the post-war political order. And the words of uh, Joachim Menzhausen, a curator of Dresden's Staatliche Kunstsammlungen, where three rooms of the Saxon electoral Kunstkammer were painstakingly recreated in 1960. Um, Menzhausen writes, in German, Kunst comes from Können, art comes from ability. Um, and he who produced exceptional things was the master of whatever field he set himself to. This view fueled the artisanal technical skills of German centers of production to heights that had never been reached before and that appeared before unreachable, just as appears to be the case against again today, end quote. That's 1977, that statement. Um, now that, Menzhausen is, of course, deeply embedded in the East German effort to reconfigure the splendid ornaments of royal power into totems of a socialist workers and peasant state. Um, but the appeal of early modern artisanal logics extends far beyond the context of post-war Germany. Um, the Kunstkammer has been an extremely persuasive source of inspiration for museum reform movements in Europe and North America beginning in the 1970s 
It became a particular subject of fascination for both German and Anglo-American cultural history in the 1980s. Uh, it became a framework for scholarly publishing in the 2000s. Um, I think this is a little bit of my own read, but in the proliferation of histories of the world in a hundred objects, I see resonances of a Kunstkammer um, kind of rubric of organization. With the help of Smith's work, I recognize in the de these developments a kind of pervasive suspicion of the traditions of text-bound disciplinarity um, and its attending rigidly hierarchical epistemologies, um, uh, anxiety about the crises of urban industrial labor that characterize European modernity, and that also in here in the autonomous concept of art as it emerged in the 18th century the kind of after uh, the sequel to Smith's story. Um, early modern Kunst with this emphasis on the doable rather than the sayable and its invitations to collaboration, to relationality and to experimentation, I think seem to make a lot of sense um, in the uh, modern and contemporary period. But I'd be really interested to hear um, from you, Pamela, on this question of the possibilities of the early modern. Um, uh, as a guide or a model for contemporary scholarship. In what way, for example, does your approach to recreation, for example, draw from the theory of imitation of early modern practitioners? Um, how does this work require you to submit and how does it require you to resist the epistemologies that govern early modern practice? Um, I'd also just be interested in what you see as the social professional, maybe political stakes of this turn to early modernity beyond the historical field, um, as I just sketched it. Um, I'll conclude here because I know there'll be lots of other questions. I just you want to reemphasize, as I hope my comment has made clear, that this is a book that causes us to see the early modern period differently, but also has the possibility of allowing us to see our own world differently as well. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Alice. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, and um, there's a lot there. Now, um, uh, Michael, what would you like us to do? Would you like to take some questions? Would you like mm -hmm. me to answer a few of those questions? Um, Why or... don't you uh, answer Alice's questions? And then, yeah, if anyone um, has questions, please uh, put them in the chat and I can uh, read those off. Uh, to Pamela. Um, okay. But yeah, why don't you respond there? Yeah, there's a lot there to, to okay, there talk was, about. Okay, there yeah. was so much there. It was so beautiful. Thank you. So beautifully articulated. Um, I'll start with, um, you know, embodied practices of archival research and, and scholarship more generally, you know, let's just say historical scholarship more generally. And of course, you know, this kind of um, division between text work and, um, and handwork, you know, is somewhat artificial. I mean, we as scholars, we imitate our mentors. We, we engage with the material of history um, with uh, previous works, um, you know, we, uh, we, writing itself is a craft and it was seen as a craft and there are writing masters in the early modern period who were quite um, important in articulating some of these and also being um, partners to printers who wanted to um, publish and, you know, um, profit from uh, recipes for making and doing. Um, so, so the embodied practices of writing are important. Um, the embodied practices of scholarship, you know, the, the kind of apprenticeship training, um, of the university, um, in, in history is, is in part or a, an embodied and performative, um, practice and training. Uh, you know, that said, there are a lot of differences as well. Um, <clears throat> so certainly archival research is, is, is a part of that as well. You know, you're dealing with a, with a body of materials. Um, <clears throat> and, 
you know, those materials have certain properties that allow them to persist and endure. And um, all of those things need to be considered by the, um, by the historian who is using archives. Why do they endure? I mean, those absolutely material questions. Um, but of course, your, your, um, your comments went much deeper than that. You know, what, what is the engagement with an archive um, and with particular kinds of archives? And I think that that brings us really to um, the question of um, the, the archives of this ineffable knowledge and what that, you know, what kinds of movements in historical writing those are associated with. Um, you talked about, you know, the hierarchies of gender, race, and class. You talked about the hierarchies of art, the fine arts, and the decorative arts, which were such a fundamental category, really, since the since the 19th century in art. And those categories were upended, as you point out wonderfully, um, from the 1950s, 1960s, importantly, um, you know, the first Kunstkammer, I think the first Kunstkammer was the Dresden Grunas Gruvulda, I mean, rearranged. Is that correct? I should know this, of course, but. <laughs> Everyone says they have the first Kunstkammer. <laughs> yeah. But um, I mean, yes, they, I think the claim that the origin of the Dresden Kunstkammer is 1560. Yeah. Oh, I don't mean the first one, but the first reconstructed one, you oh. know, to reorganize it in the in the form, I mean, in, of the of the original um, or something like the original display um, or the original order. I mean, we have the inventories of many Kunstkammer and some of those objects are still extant in museums, which they have been displayed, you know, as part of the decorative arts. And then you know, they have come forward and put, been put into a new um, new uh, framework, a new organization, new installment, um, installation, sorry. Um, and, and that is, you know, I think in the East German case, as you point out, very clearly about um, raising the kind of every man, woman, craftsperson, um, as well as upending the hierarchies of art from the visual and fine arts to the so-called lower category of the decorative arts. And, and so that, that turn in, um, in museum, you know, what they do with their decorative arts, I think is about trying to upend old categories. And this has, um, you know, in the recent reinstallation of the um, of the uh, European galleries, early modern European galleries, medieval and Renaissance galleries at the Met, for example, it very much brings together objects and um, and visual, you know, the kinds of things that we think of as the fine art, sculpture, painting. Um, brings them together to really provide a much fuller context. So, um, and this this follows on a a wonderful exhibit at the Met, which was on the values of art, and it showed early modern values of the decorative so called decorative arts in relationship to the visual arts. You know, tapestry was wildly more expensive than painter, painting, even by the most, you know, celebrated painters. Um, and uh, small, you know, goldsmith's work was um, was far more valuable um, for the skill involved than many other forms of um, uh, large sculpture, large impressive sculpture, and so on. So. Um, so those were part of the values, you know, that kind of upending of categories. And then other ones are, as you pointed out, the collaboration of the workshop, um, you know, to try to get the focus, which is very difficult to do, get the focus off the individual genius artist um, to what was is a realistic or a historical um, view of the workshop um, as being 
the out, you know, the place from which that collaborative place from which um, from which objects emerge. Um, and in that regard, you said, how do we resist and submit to the early modern episteme of the workshop and workshop practice? And I must say that, you know, the early modern workshop was very hierarchical and um, and the master was important. I mean, the master had actually bodily control over um, usually his apprentices and um, apprentices were, and journeymen especially, were um, people who did not have full civic citizenship. Um, and so, so, you know, that we have to recognize those differences. And in imitating the apprenticeship system in the Making and Knowing Project, um, what I am referring to is not that kind of authority of the master, because none of us were masters in that workshop at all. Um, but rather um, the collaboration, the sharing of knowledge, the different levels of expertise that um, that allowed, you know, there to be expert, you know, more expert practitioners and what we called novices who could work together. And that was, you know, this kind of peer um, project based work in which there really is a kind of consolidation of knowledge at the expert level by working with the novice and then the novice's kind of gradual accumulation or integration of knowledge from their teacher. So um, uh, that, you know, I have many things to say about the pedagogy of this project and just how it worked and how the collaboration worked. But I do want to say one more thing. Um, I have definitely not responded to all of your great points, but I'll just say one more thing about um, institutional resources. So this is a, you know, we had big NSF grants, National Science Foundation grants for history of science. Um, we had an NEH grant, National Endowment for the Humanities. We had other family foundations and private um, foundation funding. Um, so, you know, and that went to pay for materials, although the materials are the really the least expensive. Um, although sourcing those materials is a great adventure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, figuring out what is a, a good enough material in terms of all the kinds of historical compromises that you have to make in a project like this. Um, you know, reconstruction is not authentic in any sense whatsoever, but it does still allow you insights into the past. Um, uh, but what, what much of that, that funding went for, um, for post- paying a project manager and postdoctoral scholars. And so we have now developed an enormous amount of pedagogical resources. They are available on what we call our sandbox. And um, there are lesson plans that include how to do a hands-on project, low cost, all there in your own classroom. You know, you don't need a lab um, for most of these processes. You need a studio, you need a classroom that maybe has a sink in it. Um, and we have a lot of pilot, uh, a lot of collaborators who have worked with us to pilot our materials and their um, syllabi are there, our syllabi are there. So everything you need to do this, um, including several hands-on um, lesson plans for both instructors and students, you can download these um, from the website. Um, are available so that what we've done is make it, you know, a, a open source and open access to our data, that is the marked up data of our text. It's all available on GitHub. Our um, laboratory work, it's all available as lesson plans or much of it is available as lesson plans. More will be after May of this year also. Um, and also, um, We've, uh, we are now in the process of creating an open source, low cost and sustainable um, version of the edition software that will make openly available so that you can make your own edition of whatever you want in that dual pane display of the digital critical edition. And, you know, there is no publication tool like this really for editions, for classroom work on editions. 
that was the other the other um you know where our funding went was to a digital developer to create the edition so now we have an nsf grant to make that software openly accessible so anybody can do this um you know with some with some knowledge of um of uh github and um and tei um html and so on um that is coding and coding um text um so so what we've tried to do really in order to lower the barrier to this kind of work is to provide pedagogical resources all for free all open access and if anybody would like the um you know the urls to those i can put them up in the um, I can put them in the chat, actually. That's what I'll do. Yeah. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you. That 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 was great. Thank you. So, yeah, if you can put those up in the chat, I think I know yeah. I, that's the first thing I'm doing right after this, <laughs> <laughs> is looking at all that. Um, we have about five minutes. Uh, ah. If anyone has any questions. I think there were a couple questions in the chat already. Did I... Let me see. You know what? Oh, I see. Okay. There we go. Um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so it looks like uh, Edward Frame asked you, you talk, um, your talk reminds me of what the 20th century philosopher Gilbert Ryle once called the in, uh, intelligence legend. That is the tendency to confuse knowing how with knowing that and to give priority to the latter. Um, did you find examples of this sort of slippage in your research? And if so, can you talk about its significance? Why do you think the temptation to confuse theoretic and experiential knowledge seems strong and persistent? Um, well, I think that experiential knowledge is often described as knowing how whereas theoretical knowledge is described as knowing why. And so craftspeople have sometimes been called kind of rote imitators. Um, they've been compared to, you know, um, just mechanical replicators. Um, they know how, but they don't know why, okay? Um, and I'm trying to obviously um, say that um, they do know why. I mean, we have to look at their knowledge as a knowledge system. And actually that why that distinction is just wrong to begin with. And that's why I call it the making and knowing project. Um, so, so yes, there have been, I, I talk in the book about, I, or rather I allude in the book to some of the um uh efforts over the last you know five centuries um to to use um experiential knowledge as a kind of reform of how we think about knowledge in general there's um it's obviously you saw in that quote by paracelsus just how important it was to him to um to talk about experiential knowledge, the difference between written knowledge and experiential knowledge. He was an intellectual reformer, he was a religious reformer, and that was central, artisanal knowledge was central to his reform. I give early modern examples of that in general, um, but then of course there have been, you know, the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, and now 21st century um, writers who have also tried to think about a reform of knowledge um, through craft or reform of knowledge of some sort. I mean, if you look at Richard Sennett, for example, um, in his book, um, The Craftsman, um, you will see that there's a real um, kind of reform of civic culture that is being proposed by, um, by valorizing craft knowledge and the practice of craft or you know, Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance or some of the other, um, uh, 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 you know, making um, and maker uh, publications. So, um, so yes, I mean, there, it's a way to overturn hierarchies. It's a way to reform knowledge. And, um, you know, I wanted to both 
make clear that that's been going on for a long time in this book, but also kind of do my own overturning of these hierarchies, right? Um, in terms of the history of science. That's great. Um, is anyone, uh, any other questions? I think, uh, well, if, if everyone wants to join me uh, in thanking, oh, Okay, there you go. Yeah, yep. I just oh, put them the in links. the chat. Yeah, okay, great, so great. let me just explain. Yep, please, 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 please. <laughs> let me just yeah. say in the last couple seconds, um, you have the edition URL there. Please explore it. Please mm. give us feedback. Um, there are a few more essays. A couple scholars have not yet gotten their essays, but by um, June of this year, it will definitely be a complete and static edition. Um, the Sandbox, which at the moment contains all of our teaching resources, our mm -hmm. syllabi, our lesson plans, please go there. It will soon, all of that material will migrate to a research and teaching companion, which at the moment I put up that companion address, but it's not populated, so don't even bother going there. Um, and Edition Crafter, our publication tool, um, is still in beta version, and I've given a, a GitHub um, link there to it, um, which is a, be a totally beta version. Um, it gives you some documentation, that is the instructions for how to do it yourself. You can try it, um, but it's not by any means finished. So, And there's a few pilot collaborators with their editions, but it needs lots of work. So that just that beta version just came out two days ago. So I kind of hesitate to share it, but it's there. Um, so yeah, so it's it's just amazing the the what the what you've done. It's just I I have to lecture in an hour and a half, and uh, there's no way I'm going to get it done because now I'm just going to go off and like explore all these all these things you've produced. So I'll, I'll blame uh, blame my poor lecture on uh, on everything that you've done. But um, thank you. Uh, just uh, let uh, join me in thanking uh, uh, Professor Pamela H. Smith and her uh, her wonderful. A wonderful presentation uh, from lived experience to the written word. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, we can't wait. It seems like there's still we're still sort of producing things here, so there's still more to come. Oh, yeah. So it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, okay, everyone. thank you, thank you for inviting me, and thank, thank you, um, Professor Goff. Really, a wonderful, beautiful comment. I really appreciated it, and Thanks. thank you to uh, everyone else here. Thanks for your work.